Hey guys, what's going on? My name is Derek Kegwood. I'm a worship leader here at Family Church as well as the lead electric guitar player on our first worship album, Jesus is King. And I just wanted to take a second, sit down, and go over some of the guitar parts from the album uh, that have been requested. Some of you guys wanted to go through and see not only what parts I played, um, but what kind of led me to that place. And that's a really important point that I wanted to get across before we even begin. Um, this is going to be a little different uh, style of tutorial. Rather than going through and showing you put this finger on this string at this fret here, uh, what I really want to impart to you guys is my thought process behind these parts that I'm playing, uh, especially with the solos. I think solos are a huge part in really giving your song a lot of size, as well as uh, making your playing very memorable and not just something where you're shredding over a progression. I know that's fun to do, uh, but what my uh, goal was, not only with this album, but anytime I play a guitar solo for a song, especially worship music, I really wanted to fit the theme. I really think that's very important. And uh, so, you know, more so than teaching you the guitar parts, I want to impart to you guys, um, hopefully that same heart where, you know, it's not so much about me and what I can play and the things I can do on the guitar, but what can I add to the song. So that's kind of my heart uh, behind this whole process. And uh, hopefully you guys are ready to go. Grab your guitar and let's get started. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is uh, my gear setup that I'm using for the series of videos. Uh, this is the guitar that I use for most of the solos on uh, on the Jesus is King record. Uh, this is a guitar that was made for me uh, by MJT. It's based on like a 57 style Strat um, with DiMarzio pickups in it. You've got an area 58 in the neck and middle and 61 in the bridge. And this is uh, wired very similar to uh, how Lincoln Brewster wires up his Strats as well as Eric Johnson, where this uh, tone pot here controls the neck pickup. There's no tone control in the middle pickup. And something that's very important is this rear tone pot here is for the bridge pickup. And it's very important, especially if we're going to be using similar patches and similar tones I'm using here. Sometimes the bridge pickup on a strap can be a uh, little bright, a little harsh sounding. So what I like to do is roll that tone pot back, back a little bit, give it a little fatter sound, almost like a humbucker. Just kind of tame some of that uh, high end. I really like that for a really nice fat sound. Um, and I also have a treble bleed uh, mod done to the, uh, uh, the volume pot as well so that when you roll your volume back it doesn't get really dark and muddy sounding, maintains that high end. And uh, so this is going to be the guitar I use for uh, pretty much all these videos. Uh, obviously there's a lot of different guitars used for the rhythm tracks, but again, this is the main one that's used on all the solos. As far as my pedal setup, I'm actually not using any pedals um, per se. I'm running through a Line 6 Firehawk FX. Um, which is a very similar setup. It's actually the exact same patch that I used um, on the recording. For the recording, I actually used the Line 6 Pod X3 Live for most of the solos. And basically what I did was copied that patch over and put it on the Firehawk. And uh, the great thing about this patch is you can use this on a Firehawk, a Firehawk 1500, as well as any of the Amplify series. And I will include a link to this patch in the description below. And that way you can kind of get an idea for the kind of tones that I'm using. And each song will have its, a song specific patch of the exact sound that I used with the delays and everything already keyed into the right tempos. And uh, everything should be good to go from there. Alright, so I want to dive into the first song. Uh, it's actually, I believe, the second song on the album. But the first song we're going to be covering today. And is uh, one of my personal favorites and that is The Way. Uh, the Way is a, a great song. I love the song very much. And it was a privilege to be a part of... Uh, the writing on this song, uh, coming up with uh, the music. It's got a very interesting chord progression that I want to talk about for a second. Um, you'd be forgiven for thinking the song's in the key of D because the first chord of the song is a D. Um, but something that is established very early on in the song is that the next chord is an A minor, which immediately takes you out of the key of D and puts you into what is technically the key of G. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because if you are someone who wants to improvise over a song like this, um, you might find that if you were trying to improvise over this chord progression that uh, some of your riffs and stuff that you learned in the key of D don't exactly fit. There's one or two notes that don't fit as well. Um, the reason for that is because, again, this song is technically in the key of G, or if you want to be extra technical, would actually be considered to be D mixolydian. Um, so without going into a whole lesson about you know, modes and scales and everything, um, basically... It, you can play your same riffs that you do in the key of D. Just any time you hit come up on a C sharp note, drop that down to a C. Um, or if you want to simplify it that much more, maybe stay away from the key of D and play some of your riffs in the key of G. 
And now, fear not, I'll go down every riff that I play in the song, and you'll see how um, some of the shapes and some of the uh, melody choices seem a little unconventional, but what I was really going for was really emphasizing that C note in the song, because that's what kind of gives it that mixolydian feel, um, that kind of interesting uh, chord progression that I really like. So I just want to take a second and address that really quick for those of you guys who may want to not worry about how I play the solo, but try to improvise. Just want to give you a few pointers there. Alright, so the intro of this song actually establishes a melodic theme that is carried over through all the turnarounds, uh, as well as the uh, solo and the outro of the song, or I guess you would call it the second solo of the song. Um, and it's a very simple melody line, and uh, it goes like this. Intro, three, four. <laughs> So that was the intro uh, progression or the intro melody. And again, this is going to be the same pattern you're going to play in the outros and also a uh, similar pattern that you're going to use for the beginning of the solo. And again, I'm not really going note for note on this, so hopefully you have a good enough angle here where you can see my fingers and you can kind of see what I'm going for here. Try to get some nice shots of that as well and uh, see where we go from here. So uh, the opening uh, melody line goes like this. So those are the first two chords. So over the D chord, we're doing uh, kind of like a D root five or like a, a high power chord here. Then do a little walk down. Remember I said earlier, the song is in the key of D mixolydian. So where typically you would do something like this. See, it doesn't sound that great, does it? So what we're doing here is we're going to a C note here. And this is going to be going over the A minor 7 chord. So it goes like this. So what I'm doing there is hitting the C as well as that G note up top. And you notice I'm doing a little bit of a slide going into it. Then I do that slide one more time. slide or with a hammer on. Now drop that down to the B. Now drop down to this little harmony when we go, uh, this little harmony part here, when we go back to the D. So one more time real slow. the intro. Um, so the first half of the first verse is actually no playing at all um, and that was intentional. I really like to you know find little sections of songs where I can just not play um, so that you can when you do come in it helps to kind of build the song. Um, so we're actually going to skip the first half of the first verse and move into the rhythmic pattern that I play on the second half of the first verse and it goes something like this. <laughs> So that was the rhythm part for the second half of the first verse. A little confusing, right? Uh, for the second half of the first verse. And so what I'm doing here, um, one key element for if you're going to play this part is you need to have a dotted eighth note delay. You need to have it tapped down the correct tempo. The tempo of the song is 140 beats per minute. And so when you have that in, uh, in the correct time, you do this very simple pattern. It sounds like this. So what I'm doing here is taking this like a like a D2 kind of shape. This is like if you were taking A2 and slide it up here. And just kind of taking the middle notes here. And uh, it goes something like this. And I'm doing just a simple picking pattern. In fact, if you take off the delay, 
This is what it sounds like without the delay. So now here it is with the delay. So you notice I'm doing something there. I'm doing a really tight palm muted technique on the uh, D and G strings. But then when I go to the B string note, I actually let that ring out a little bit like this. So you might find with the rhythm playing that adds a lot of dynamic um, to your parts, uh, letting some notes ring out where some of them are kind of choked down and palm muted. It's a great technique for adding dynamics to your rhythm parts. So from there it goes back into the intro section. We're not going to go over that again, but I'm going to play it for you so you can hear it in context. I'm actually doing a couple of different things here. Now what you can do is basically copy and paste the same part from verse 1 with the palm muting um, and like I said earlier you can mix and match the palm muted versus the more open tones maybe uh, open it up a little bit more as you get towards build towards the pre-chorus but what I'm doing here is I'm experimenting doing some uh, different natural harmonics so for those of you who don't know you, your guitar has multiple spots where uh, there's natural harmonics that come across on the string. So what I'm doing here is going over the 7th fret. And basically I'm doing a very similar picking pattern. Uh, that I did on the first verse and just going over the natural harmonics of, of the guitar neck. So. And no Alright, so now we're going into the pre-chorus of the song and what I'm doing here is kind of a similar chord shape that I did in the verse where I'm going down to this and then I slide down to this like open D suspended shape So it kind of adds some nice dissonance, and when you do it with the delay and the reverb, it really adds a nice effect. Do that twice. And one of the things I like to do is do a really fast palm muted uh, technique on the D string and slowly start to open it up kind of as a build effect. So it goes like this. And that gives you a nice build up into the chorus of the song. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. Alright, so the chorus of the way is a very simple chord progression. It's actually the same chord progression as the rest of the song, uh, save for the pre chorus. Um, and what I'm doing is uh, kind of going back to that melody line that I played for the intro. But instead of doing them as individual notes, I'm uh, doing kind of a strumming pattern like this. So 
So again, we're going back to that same shape as we did on the intro. Then over the A minor and the C chord, we're just taking that same shape and sliding it down a whole step. And then for the G, uh, you have the choice of sliding your ring finger down to the fourth fret. It's a little bit of a stretch there. Or you can put your ring finger on this D note here and do it like this. So it really just comes down to if you have enough stretch and you can make that interval or not. So uh, a little slow down, it sounds like this. Alright, so here is the pre-chorus going straight into the chorus and context. Pre-chorus. leads us into the most fun part of the song. Let's just be honest, you know you like this part of the song, and that is the guitar solo. Now the guitar solo on this song was a lot of fun. I did a lot of interesting shapes I'm not very used to. I really wanted to challenge myself, and I kind of play a little bit outside the box. So some of, the, uh, some of my fingerings and some of my patterns might seem a little unconventional, um, and also some of the faster sections. I don't know what was in the Red Bull that day because it was a late night of recording, but it was a lot of fun. I'm really glad we got it in that take, uh, but I am saying that to kind of preface this whole section by saying there's probably some of you that can play this a little bit better note for note than even I can, and I wrote the solo, so you know that says a lot about me, um, but I'm just going to give you, again, the essence of my approach behind the solo and kind of what I was thinking in terms of the theme and the sound that I was going for. So you'll notice that the uh, solo of the song um, starts very similar to the intro where it starts with that little melody line. And then what I like to do is um, take that melody up a little bit so it kind of does something similar to this. And that is a key, uh, that little simple riff is a key to getting the solo right. A lot of uh, deep half, uh, deep vibrato, deep half step bends, I find gives your solos a lot of emotion, um, as well as uh, just giving them a little bit more interesting uh, tone quality rather than just doing chromatically. I don't know, something about that just sounds kind of lifeless, but when I do it with the vibrato, So that little walk down leads to this little, uh, it's like a string skipping pattern. So. Do that pattern one more time, real slow. One more time, even slower. Then I think on the recorded version I did something similar to this. And I'll be honest with you guys, I don't really like that. <laughs> Again, I don't know what was in the Red Bull that night when we were recording this. Um, I like the idea of that pattern, um, but for me it just felt a little out of left field, even more so than I'm, I'm used to. So what I do when I play the song live is I actually do the same exact pattern but instead of doing it on the D string, I do it on the G string, and you'll see that that really adds a really nice tension. 
So, it, again, those C notes have a really nice rub against the chord progression that I really like, and I was wanting to emphasize that a lot with this solo. So, you could do it either way. Technically, on the D strings, it's a little bit more accurate, or not a little bit, it's exactly what I played on the recording. Uh, but how I play it live now, and if we ever did it like a deluxe edition or a remastered version of this song, I would definitely change that um, in the solo. I'd leave everything else pretty much the same, though, but I would definitely change that. So, uh, one more time the solo from the top, a little slower. <laughs> So something fun you can do if you have a, a tremolo arm or a whammy bar is uh, try to get that G down to an F sharp. So something like this. It's okay if it's a little out of tune. This is meant to have a uh, kind of like a Van Halen dive bomb kind of effect. And I'm actually using that open string to give me time to slide up to the upper octave of the neck. So I'll show you uh, kind of how that works. So, a little sloppy because I slowed it down a little too much there, but you're kind of getting the idea. I'm using the open string to give me some time to go up to the higher octave. And something that is really important, again, is that nice deep vibrato. And uh, when I do these bends, really digging into them. Now, there's a couple ways you can do that. You can either do it really clean. Or you can do what I call add a little grease to it, where you uh, kind of get uh, multiple strings in there. Just adds a really nice angst to it. So one more time, going from the uh, low register all the way up to the higher register. And then what I do uh, from there is do the same melody that I did at the beginning of the solo but I do it up an octave. And then you go for that really big bend. Uh, now this is something that you definitely want to practice if you're not used to doing big bends like that is really working on your intonation. Um, it's okay for the bends to be a little flat or a little sharp for effect. Like sometimes when I'm doing uh, those half step bends, I intentionally let them get a little flat just to have some uh, nice, uh, nice angst, some nice, uh, nice attitude to these uh, songs, a little bit of soul to it. Um, but you don't want to use that as a crutch. You want to still be able to do it clean. So I would practice uh, getting that bend nice and clean. And that's kind of the the big uh, crescendo of the solo, where it goes uh, something like this. Alright, and then this moves into the fast section of the solo. Now, I'll be honest with you guys, I'm not a very uh, efficient uh, speed player. I'm not a shredder by any means. I like to say I play swiftly, um, but I would not go so far as to say I play fast. Um, definitely not at the level of a lot of you shredders out there. Um, but the fast section goes something similar to this. It's really hard to slow that down, uh, but I'll show you kind of the pattern I'm going for. And really, you can do any pattern that you like. Um, the biggest thing is you want to make sure you end on a G note. Because uh, that's the note you're going to kind of hang on for the bridge section. So, one more time, an attempt at playing that slow. And some of you will find, uh, as you get better, not that I would say I'm better, but as you get more efficient at playing fast, it's really hard to slow some of these patterns down. So, if you see little inaccuracies, that's why. Uh, a lot of the stuff I'm playing by feel, and uh, I'm really just making excuses. So, let me show you this pattern one more time. Alright, 
And so now let's attempt to play that solo in context. Instrumental. there I understand but again the the biggest things I want to kind of give you guys the themes of these solos kind of what my thought process was now I kind of skipped over the bridge section there basically all I'm doing there is kind of hanging on this uh, this G here now one of the tricks is when we were recording this I, this is actually very quiet in this room uh, my guitar's not coming through any speakers it's just coming uh, to my earbuds but when we were recording the song we had live studio monitors that were running pretty hot and what was happening is I was getting some really nice um, natural feedback, kind of like in the old days when the guys would put their guitars in front of the Marshall half stacks. Is kind of the sound I was going for. Um, if you're not able to recreate that, a trick you can do is kick on a little extra distortion or maybe a wah pedal and uh, kind of mess around with that wah pedal. A wah pedal is a great way to get this technique because it will hit that frequency where it just wants to sustain for a really long time. And that's kind of fun to get, especially if you get it to feedback naturally. Um, if you're not able to get it to feedback, you can just go back to the same chord progression we did on the pre-course. You can do that same thing and remember to end it building on that D, just like we did in the pre-course. Now we're moving into the final part of the song. This is the uh, outro or the second instrumental, whatever you want to call it, uh, for the way. And uh, I kind of went with a similar approach to uh, the solo, uh, very similar melody line, but instead of playing that verbatim again, I made kind of a creative choice here. I wanted to do um, some what's what are called unison bends. Now, unison bends are a fun uh, technique to use, but can get a little tricky. Um, it's basically where you take a note like this A, for example and try to bend, keeping that note stable while bending uh, this G note here, trying to bend that up to the A, and it has a real angsty sound to it like this. Now one of the things I did was I did a strumming pattern on it like this. And I'm not too concerned about it being super clean. That's just a, a, a creative thing on my end uh, where I'm not too concerned about this sounding clean because the whole song kind of has a, I call it a greasy vibe to it uh, where it just has some interesting intervals and everything. And so um, I find when you play it really clean, it just doesn't have the same effect. But, you know, to each his own. Um, but what I'm doing here is doing that same melody line from the, uh, from the solo. I'm basically doing the A to B to C using those unison, uh, unison bends. To the D. So that's the start of it. And then I go to a little melody line uh, up top. And this is another fast section here where uh, I'm not entirely sure exactly what it is that I played, uh, but this is pretty similar to how I play it live. So when we're on that high D there with the unison bend, things I do, a little trick you can do if you're not very good at playing fast, like I'm not, is a switch that neck pickup gives you a little throw to your sound, and I find that really sounds good around the 12th fret, which is where we're at right now, so I'm kind of doing this little... Kind of similar to that. So now, let's see if I can do this. Um, so we're going to take the last chorus into the outro and see how it goes. Chorus three, four.
So that is basically how you play the way. Again, guys, I'm not necessarily going for a note-for-note -note instructions here because I really think it kind of feeds the purpose of this video series. I want to kind of show you where I come up with some of these ideas for some of these parts. And, uh, you know, just to show you that I don't play this the same way every time. Um, a lot of times these solos have, again, themes. They kind of have, like, I, I think of it as like brackets. So this is about what the solo is, but I can kind of go a little bit to the left or to the right and do some things that are a little outside, just depending on how I'm feeling at the moment. And that's how I think every good solo should be. I listen to some of the most famous guitar solos in history. If you go watch those artists live, oftentimes they don't play it exactly like that. Sure, they might get some of the more signature riffs, um, but you know they, they almost never play the same thing twice. And that's because a good solo is meant to be fluid. You want it to be iconic, yes, but don't be so um, married to a particular riff or a particular pattern that takes away any of your creative flow uh, when it comes to actually playing the song live. Um, it's so much more important to me to hear you guys play the song your way um, instead of the way. See what I did there? Um, but the most important thing is you're getting the themes right and what you're playing is, uh, is really helping to... Uh, improve the song, improve uh, the vibe that your team is going for when you're covering these songs. Um, you know, we do a lot of songs from a lot of different artists, and even if a song has a guitar solo in it, uh, sometimes I might be feeling it a different way than the person who originally recorded it. That's no disrespect to them. I'm definitely not saying I'm a better guitar player than them. I'm just saying that I'm different from them. So you might approach these songs a little differently, and if that is the case, I hope that you can take the um, riffs and ideas that I show you today and apply them to your own style and uh, hopefully come up with something that's even better than what I come up with. So thank you guys so much for joining me on this video where we go over the way. Uh, be sure to click subscribe and hit your notification bell. I will be uploading more tutorials as the time goes on and uh, if you have any requests of songs that you would like to see me tackle next, uh, feel free to put them in the comment section below. Otherwise, I'll see you guys in the next video. Have a blessed day.